Another NFL overtime thriller that does not go the Bills' way. Josh Allen seems to be snake bit when it comes to getting that W in OT as the Bills fall back to 500 with a loss to the Eagles in OT. I'm Kevin Carroll. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone podcast, everyone. And I'm John Scott here inside Lucas Finan- or Lincoln Financial Stadium <laughs> here. Oh, my gosh. Re-ru- redo. Lincoln Financial Field. <laughs> My goodness here. We're off to a great start. Lucas Uh, Financial Oil Stadium. Yes. uh, As the Bills, we're going to toe a line throughout the show, Kevin. I think of the the moral victory, the encouraging things, while all fully understanding it's a results-based business and and the results matter most for a team that is clawing for their life to try to get into the postseason. I think, and John, we're not coaches, we're not players. We can take moral victories. They'll all say the right thing after that there are no moral victories. But I'm going to tell you this right now, and maybe you agree with me. I think we're on the same page with how we view the Bills right now. I view the Bills as having a better chance of making a run to push and get into the playoffs right now than I would have had the Bills done nothing really on offense all night and squeaked out like a 10-7 to win over the Eagles and got the W, I think from what we saw against who is the best team in the NFL right now record-wise, what the Bills were able to do on offense and early on defense and how the league in general looks right now, I think the Bills do stand a decent chance if they get all their ducks in a row after this bye week to make that push maybe a little leeway for one more loss left on the uh, record there. I think this game paired a little bit with the way that they played against the New York Jets, especially offensively last game, gives you the, the encouraging feeling that the offense at least is back in a place where with Josh Allen playing at an elite MVP caliber level, they can beat anyone in the league. And that's what made that six-week lull so confusing, head-scratching, and damning for their postseason hopes. It's because the defense was doing enough during that stretch for them to win some of these games, even if the offense wasn't humming at their high-flying level. They, they should have been able to do enough to win those football games, and they just weren't. And now you're seeing the offense since the change of coordinator from Ken Dorsey to Joe Brady – It has coincided with Josh Allen's ascent back to the player that we know him to be. And Sean McDermott even indicating after this game that getting Josh Allen right, getting him back, was a a big factor in his decision to move on from Ken Dorsey and give the keys to the car to Joe Brady, at least in an interim basis here. 500 yards of total offense, and Josh Allen had well over 400 of those himself. That, and he alone, is why you feel that even understanding the daunting and schedule that lies ahead and the opponents that they face, they truly can beat any team in the league. And they nearly handed the second loss to the team that, that currently has the best record in football. And you had the Josh Allen experience of two rushing TDs, touchdown passes, a tough interception coming at a rough time. But overall, mm-hmm. when you look at the body of work Josh Allen put out there in this game, That was what I think we were clamoring for earlier is that even when it comes down to the little things of Josh Allen buying time and rolling out to get his receivers open and present that threat that he might take off, played a large role in this game and the Bills able to do what they did against the Eagles. I mean, Josh Allen was Josh Allen. You're right. The Josh Allen experience that one play where, How in the world was he not sacked? How did he have the strength just overall, but the arm strength to get this ball out to Stephon Diggs, who's flanking across the field? I mean, it was remarkable. The runs and eluding pressure and weaving through the defense and getting first downs or touchdowns or whatever it may be. I I mean, Allen was doing everything and, and exposing and showing every bit of his elite arsenal against the Philadelphia Eagles, who, yeah, I mentioned it going into this game that defensively their overall numbers don't jump off the page as an elite-level defense, but we know the talent. We saw the talent that was out there on that team. And so 
to once again back up a performance against an extremely talented New York Jets defense with an even better game against the Philadelphia Eagles. I, I think, yeah, that, you know, the lot was made going into the game of Josh Allen screaming on the sidelines during the New York game. I'm back. I'm feeling that I'm back. And he says it was simply a quote from John Wick. But what was John Wick doing when he says lines like that? He went from being retired and kind of like, oh, I don't want to be back to, you know, having the great fight sequences for an hour and a half, two hour movie. That's almost like what Josh is. He, he went from, you know, in his shell to all of a sudden everything that, that made him who he is has come back to the forefront. That's what's, that's what's encouraging. So if, if you want to think of this going into the bye week with a glass half full and a positive note, just think and dial up the highlights of what you've seen from Josh Allen the past two weeks. And in particular, I think the best game we've seen from him certainly this season is this one here against the Eagles. Uh, I think that should, should give you at least a little more hope in the tank that, that maybe a good outcome could come uh, in this postseason push. Absolutely. And one thing, one theme that's continued this year that uh, has been brought up time and time again, and it was certainly the case in this game tonight, was that the team that really beats the Bills is the Bills themselves. I mean, well, seven penalties in the first quarter alone, penalties throughout. It was very one-sided when it came to penalties for the Bills and penalties for the Eagles. And you can complain about the refereeing all you want, but – when you take a look at it, a lot of it was just undisciplined undisciplined play, undisciplined before the snap, John, which is an issue. And again, that's another common theme we're seeing throughout this. This was a game where the Bills could have gotten out, and, and as the game went on, they were unable to overcome some of the penalties. But early in the first half, it was shooting themselves in their own foot. So six penalties for 37 yards in the first quarter, 10 for 75 in the first half. It, it was it was awful, and I'm looking at my notes. Uh, third and 10, the defense early in the game had an opportunity to get off the field. Rasul Douglas called for a holding. Fourth and one, the brotherly shove tush push was coming, but Jordan Phillips gets an offsides that doesn't even you know allow the play to to happen. Then Ed Oliver, an illegal use to the hands, it didn't ultimately matter as they went down and Philadelphia scored their first touchdown of the game. But there was some opportunities there for them to get off the field to stop uh, a touchdown drive early in this football game. And you're right, shot themselves in the foot. 10 for 75 is incredible. I mean, if you had that in a game alone, you would say, yeah, that's rough. We really have to address it. They had that in the first half. I will say this, though, Kevin. Only one penalty for five yards the rest of the way, including overtime. So they righted some wrongs. And I know officiating in general is going to be a highly debated topic, or maybe not debated, but you know something that's stirring and burning hot for a lot of Bills fans, at least according to my mentions after this <laughs> one, because they felt that it was it was pretty uneven, and and they're not completely incorrect. I mean, four penalties for 30 yards for the Eagles and 11 for 80 and like i said 10 for 75 in the first half for the bills so that and then you're right drops james cook is someone we can get into right now he yep. had what seemed to be a touchdown pass that would have been an answer for the buffalo bills and then he drops it and then tyler bass misses a kick he missed a couple kicks and so it's just these are things that it's proving that in the past the Bills' margin for error was larger. They could get away with some of these things not going their way, but especially against a team the caliber of the Eagles, but we've seen it in far lesser opponents this season. The Bills, just when they have the self-inflicted wounds, they just are not able to claw crawl out of that hole the same way that they used to, and they, and they weren't again here tonight. Missed opportunity is a big thing in this game with the Bills, and of course... You can just flat out circle um, in overtime when Gabe Davis and Josh Allen weren't on the same page. But it was also kind of funky early in the game, John, where Josh Allen basically dumps one right into James Cook's hand coming down the sideline, and he dropped it. At first, it looked like a decent play was made on it, but then the replay showed it wasn't. Uh, you then don't see James Cook 
for a while. So this is the second game where it looks like they told him to sit down for a bit. But when I look at James Cook in the start of this game, John, I look at a chance on uh, maybe the second drive of the game where he's running with the ball and he's coming up on the first down marker. And if he plows through the guy trying to tackle him, he gets it. Instead, he stopped and just stepped out of bounds. The whole reason why James Cook started to heat up was because he was running with authority. And we saw him do that a bit more in the second half when the Bills were able to basically roll down the field with the run game. But I know James Cook is young, but between the drop ball and just bailing out on a play where you could have got a first down, really, I don't think sits well with the coaching staff. It doesn't sit well with me as the eyeball test goes of, what are you going to get from the guy? Are you going to get from the guy a guy who's determined to run and run his hardest or get from the guy someone who's going to step out one yard away from a first down to not get hit? I tweeted the exact same thing. What Woo. is he doing? I, I, I didn't – it was it was wild. I think they ultimately got the first down anyway, um, and I think maybe later on that drive – is when he had the drop and he didn't play the entire next possession. Um, there was also some usage things of, you know, late in the half passing situations. Maybe his pass protection is not very good because having Latavius Murray on the field for obvious passing situations seems peculiar to me. Mm -hmm. um, even with the drop for James Cook, we, we've seen enough to know that he is the better option in terms of a pass catching running back. But it's something to monitor, right? So he fumbles, he is sat, and then he comes back and, and seems to play much better. We all agreed, I think, that we didn't feel it was necessary for him to take the seat, but lo and behold, he did. And then it seems like the same thing happened here. And yeah, he, he played inspired football, was more impactful after that. Certainly not as impactful as what that touchdown would have been, but still does James Cook need this type of motivation? What is the relationship here? It's just, it's interesting that I, I know maybe the biggest gripe people have with the way that Cook has maybe been handled in these situations is the inconsistency of with other players when they make mistakes, they don't seem to face the same consequences. And so that would be an interesting thing to try to dive into. Certainly I, I didn't, hear Sean McDermott get asked about James Cook after the game, it, it kind of gets buried, rightfully and understandably so, considering it happened so early and everything else that happened. But something to take note, but James Cook's an impactful player. He had six catches for, for 57 yards, even with that drop. 16 carries, 43 yards. That's basically, or it is, it's another 100 yards. It's 100 yards of total offense. He's, he's one of their weapons, and he needs to be someone that uh, is more consistent but needs, I think, maybe to be handled maybe a little differently when, when mistakes come. And while he's out, Ty Montgomery, John, I thought looked Ty pretty – Ty Johnson. Ty Johnson. You know what? <laughs> I knew I was going to say that, so I wrote down not to say Ty Montgomery, and I did it anyways. But, yeah, when, he, when his number is called upon, I think he's looked good this season when they've needed him. It goes back to the Leonard Fournette conversation, and I think that one maybe will be interesting to see how it unfolds in the bye week because if you're Fournette, he wants to play. I know he signed to the practice squad, but I think maybe that was intended to be a good place for him to learn the offense, and then, as he said, four weeks in or so, he should have a grasp on it, and here we are. Four weeks in, he probably feels like he has a good enough grasp and wants to see the field, what is the path to that? And if he feels maybe there isn't a path, does he try? We've seen other Tavon Austin or things like that, veterans who want to play. Maybe they just they don't want to stick around. We'll see because I agree. I think Ty Johnson has been a nice little surprise. Nothing popping off the page. Six carries, 19 yards for him. But he, he had some good runs. Could it be Latavius Murray? I don't know. That guy plays a ton. I mean, he plays a ton of snaps and nine carries, 30 yards. He had some moments as well. If, if you're looking for a shakeup in the running back room, I, I, you'd have to get Johnson or Murray out of the way if you want to see Leonard Fournette. And I'm, I'm not sure, Kevin, if that's something that's going to happen.
I think Johnson has done enough to kind of stay in that spot. And, and here's the key, and, and I know a lot of people don't talk, he's a special teams guy. And so that that plays a factor, whereas I, I would find it almost impossible to think Leonard Fournette would be having a similar role in special teams as someone like Ty Johnson. Yeah, and I think Johnson could even cut into some of Murray's playing time, I think, just by the eye test. I think it's warranted. I think what I also like is that it seems Joe Brady is utilizing these backs as they should, best suited, right? I mean, yeah, I said Murray's out there in pass catching situations, but if he's good in protection, then that's fine. Um, but getting Cook the ball in space in the passing game, I mean, I think seven targets on six catches for 57 yards for James Cook, like, that's what he should do. I mean, that, that's that's where you have an a plus matchup is when James Cook is in the passing game. I think Ty Johnson can provide things like that. We obviously saw what he did when he got the the screen pass against the Jets for the touchdown. I, I think he's someone that is earning the right to yeah five plus touches a game. I think that's good. And I agree with you. I'm sorry. I'm trying not to cough right now, <laughs> John. Um... Gabe Davis and the way the game ended, I mean, that's going to be circled for sure with him not on the same page as Josh Allen. But again, we have that same scenario that we've seen that roller coaster of a season for Gabe Davis, who up until that point had a really good game, even had the go ahead, go ahead score towards the end of the first half, came up clutch at times in this one where it's trending towards, well, this is a big Gabe Davis game, and then the way the game ended with uh, him and Josh not being on the same page, he's going to be remembered for that moving forward as we go into the bye week and not for everything else he did in that game. And I think that's kind of going to be, as you said, the way we, we remember the Gabe Davis Bills career of, Thir the 13 seconds game and, and how incredible he was in that one. And maybe the 80 plus yard touchdown reception against the Steelers last season and some of these moments, but then maybe these, what people would think would be a, a dropped pass in that Jets game when Josh Allen hurt his elbow a year ago, mm -hmm. or this being on the wrong page of things like that. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's the inconsistencies. I mean, he was the best receiver they had. I mean, six receptions, 105 yards, and a touchdown. He came on 12 targets, so a lot of people are going to look and, and continue to hammer the catch percentage numbers for him. And I'm trying to remember. I, I don't I don't remember enough on my recall right now of was he dropping passes? Was he not, you know, where you get the discrepancy from receptions to targets. I, I'm not positive, but I agree. He was... He was an impactful player. He was a good number two guy in this football game that ultimately put up the top numbers. So it, it was it was a tough game. game. I give him credit, and I, I always like to do this. He's the first person any of us went to in the locker room, and he stood there and took it. He took yeah. the questions and said that at the end of it, it's an option route. He went to the left, and Josh threw it on the inside, and Gabe was going to the outside. And... Uh, that was the difference. And I know the broadcast picked up his reaction. He, he, he was pretty mad at himself and kicking himself after the game. I will say this, and I mentioned it on the postgame show, unfortunately, the option routes, we've seen a good amount of miscommunication, not being on the same page on some of these between Allen and Davis. Uh, the ridiculous, absurd intentional grounding mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Which now there's is two when, of them. Right. And it's like, well, no, he just stopped and Josh threw it deep and things like that. It, it was, there seems to be some, you know, mis, misconnection there. We obviously don't know every time that Gabe Davis runs a, an option route that they are on the same page, but you've just noticed some moments where, okay, um, they just don't seem to be in sync completely. And nobody's 100%. We even saw Diggs, I think, and and Allen get on, you know, have a little off at times. But um, tough finish for them because you, you kind of had that feeling. Can this Bills defense hold it? And, and you didn't really have a lot of confidence. You, you kind of felt, all right, the Bills got to score a touchdown or, or they're not going to win the game. And that's ultimately how it played out. No, and I'll get into that in a second. But during our <laughs> postgame show, 
talking to Fred Jackson while you were still in the locker room about that coming from a player's perspective with the blitz coming at your quarterback and they alluded to it on the broadcast and Fred kind of backed it up you know as a wide receiver with that option route there the the way to go is to cut that in because it's easier for the quarterback to hit someone in the middle of the field with more room to operate, more room to lead someone because there was no safety out there. Um, and by going to the corner, you're just asking for a harder throw from the quarterback. And basically, as Fred put it, that's how he viewed it. That's what it boiled down to was, yeah, they weren't on the same page, but it was more of Gabe Davis not being on the same page. And that's why we love having Fred on the postgame show, because these are things that, as, as I say often, and you agree, we're not as smart as these guys. We, don't, we right. don't know the game the same way. So to hear a former player who was good in the passing game, who, who is a, was, a, was a solid, solid, good player for the Bills and Fred Jackson, to lay it out that way and explain it, I, I think is great. Cause, and I didn't hear Fred say this because I was in the locker room, as you yeah. said. So to have it explained that way, phenomenal stuff yeah no absolutely and as i said at the end of the post game show and you started to allude to it there about not having confidence in the bills defense i i kind of would have went for it on fourth down i was leading to, towards it sean mcdermott saying after the game maybe if they had a couple more yards he would have really entertained going for it there but I just didn't see three points as doing much of anything with the amount of time left in overtime that I think it would have been worth it to not so much try for another shot in the end zone, but get the first down and just keep on moving the ball. Certainly a, a, a worthy conversation to have um, to contemplate that. And uh, I guess I, I guess because, it was chaotic in the end of the game. I'm, I'm kind of like trying to focus on six different things while also see it on a delay while I'm listening to the, the fans and things like that. <laughs> yep. um, it's, it's not always the easiest thing to, to process and think of all those things. I guess I would have been in favor of it to go for the kill shot. What was it fourth and what? I don't remember <laughs> because with the time on the clock, I was getting dressed to go on set while I was watching everything. So I think it was doable. I don't think it was, it was fourth and six. Okay. I, oh, six, I was going to say fourth and six. Had, if I had a guess, I was going to say fourth and fourth six. Fourth and six from the 22. I, fourth, it's, it's a lot. So I guess I don't, I guess I'm okay with kicking the field goal there. Um, especially understanding the reality is they should have won it because the play was there on, four, on third down. Yeah. I mean, and this goes to my what I was kind of leaning in towards was we've seen this too much with the Bills and their defense over the entire season that they make no mistake about it. They put in a solid effort. They're dealing with injuries across the board there. A great effort in the first half. They did what they needed to do to keep the Bills in this game. But you're reaching a point where off the top of my head, I can go with the Patriots, the Broncos in this game, and I'm thinking maybe there's one more, maybe Jacksonville. I'm not sure off the top of my head where the offense did what it needed to do to take the lead with not a lot of time left on the clock, and the defense just couldn't finish the game and I just have that feeling right now with close games, as good as the Bills' defense can be at times, you don't want to have to rely on them with over a minute of time left on the clock at the end of a game. So the Jets, I mean, the Bills are up 13-6 to six entering the fourth quarter. 4.55 left is when they tied it on that ridiculous catch by Garrett Wilson. And then the defense gives up uh, – the field goal, but they're in tough field position, and obviously then the punt return. So, I mean, kind of the Jets, you could say, to your point, I think with Jacksonville, it was more the Bills' score with 2.11 to go, 
to pull it within five and they just couldn't get a stop. Um, I think that, you know, it's not the exact same, but you're right. The New England game was was real bad because it was Mac Jones just slinging it down the field against them. Uh, Denver game was bad, obviously. And then this one. So you're right. And Terrell Bernard kind of indicating not as an excuse, but just saying execution, man, they just, they just can't make the plays at the end and, and maybe fatigue sets in and that, and that makes things harder from an execution standpoint. But I, I think you maybe put this one under the, if they had the answer for why is it continue to happen, it wouldn't be happening. Um, but it, it's funny because it not funny. It's, it's interesting because it, it masks what for two, two and a half quarters, three quarters, Mm-hmm. Was, was a pretty impressive defensive performance against a unit the caliber of the Eagles. Yeah, like a tale of two halves. Mm-hmm. It was the Bills' defense able to get pressure on Jalen Hurts, get to Jalen Hurts. And then the second half, it was a completely different game. They were able to run the ball on the Bills, big chunk runs. Hurts able to get yardage with his legs and get the ball through the air and – I go back to the Broncos game. I don't know if you were with us on the postgame show yet, but like I told Fred, that's twice. Russell Wilson did it. Jalen Hurts did it. Basically threw up a prayer into the end zone, and the Bills defense unable to stop it. And that's twice this season that that's happened to them. And that's called making a play. I mean – that's a, it's not an easy play, but Micah Hyde was 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 there, and he just didn't make the play. And you can call it lucky, you could call it bad defense. I mean, you could you whatever side of the coin you want to go on. Um, but that's how they take the lead. Um, but they did such a great job in the first half. I'm looking at this. Jalen Hurts was four for eleven for 33 yards in the first half. He finishes the game 18 to 31 for 200 yards, three touchdowns, and an, and an interception. So, and, and even more so to what you said, he had seven rushes for 22 yards in the first half. He had 14 for 65 total in the game. So I think his legs, the the running game overall, opened things up. Led by Hurts, I think scrambling, he was a much better and efficient passer, and, and things just opened up for them in the second half. And and they just they couldn't stop him. And and yet. They all thought, and I think I thought it too, no way Jake Elliott can, can push it through this rain and wind and Correct. whatever from 59 yards. And they thought with the two penalties on Jason Kelsey and playing some good stops there, I, I thought maybe they would have got it. But, you know, that great kick by a good kicker who's been clutch and obviously knows how to kind of work it here in this, this stadium – and it, it just comes back to it. Like, yeah, two turnovers for Philadelphia, but they didn't have the penalties. They didn't have the missed kicks, the, the missing of points, the dropped passes, like the opportunities overall. And this goes to the defense. Like they just, for whatever reason, when the chips are on the table and you got to have it, they've just not been capable of having anyone make a play. Yeah, it's tough. And, I'll go back to what I kind of started the podcast with, John. You look at these incredible games in the NFL that have involved the Bills. The Bills are losing all of them, or they have lost all of them. This one, the game against the Chiefs in the playoffs. I think, wasn't there a game in Tennessee that went into overtime as well that didn't go the Bills' way? Tampa. You're thinking the Tampa game. The Tampa game against Tom Brady. It's these epic games that people will text you after like, Oh my God, what a game. Can can you believe that? It's like, yeah, I mean, the bills are a team that that's good. That can go toe to toe with the best teams in the league, but man, just unable to finish in overtime. It's like Josh Allen snake bit or something. Cause usually it comes down to the defense. Well, let me ask you this. It usually comes down to the defense what do you, how much of this do you put on Sean McDermott that these teams cannot win these types of games, at least it seems recently? And largely it's because the defense is the ones who can't get the stop at the end. I thought about this, uh, I think it was before Hertz ran in the overtime winner where they were slowly working their way down the field. 
And uh, the defense softened up. I think it was like on a third down and gave uh, number six there. He's, I keep, it's not A.J. Devontae Brown. Smith. Smith, just so much cushion to pick up the first down and keep the chains moving that I said to myself, that looks like a kind of defense that Sean McDermott wanted to stop doing a la Leslie Frazier on what Frazier was doing that I thought for the most part they were. It seemed kind of kind of weak, and, and it's hard with how banged up this Bills defense is right now to just not have to take that into consideration that they don't have the athletes out there that they should and to give McDermott props for what he's been able to do. But the fact that you're just unable to close out games – with this defense, I mean, you're looking at a matter of the Bills could easily have had three more wins here. Right. And that's what I'm talking about, that margin of error. They just, they're not able to overcome it. They're op not opportunistic enough to close the door. I agree with you on the the whole soft things. Also would love to get your thoughts on this. I was shocked the way that he managed the end of regulation in terms of taking like these timeouts to set the defense or to ice the kicker when you knew there would still be time on the clock. And then he takes a knee with one timeout left with 20 seconds to go. Like you have Josh Allen. I understand you're on the 25 yard line, but as like Ross Tucker, I think it was, or others put out there, it's as if we haven't seen, or this team hasn't seen that you can get in a field goal range and, 20 seconds or less like they, they witnessed that it was part of their biggest demises um, of recently was the 13 seconds and you have Josh Allen you have these receivers like not even giving yourself an opportunity to heave it down the field maybe try to get a pass interference or something uh, that was another Sean McDermott decision that I just was really dumbfounded by that, that he would almost just decide that they wanted their fate to be 100% determined in overtime without just, just testing it. Like, what was there really to lose? I, that, I didn't understand that. What did you think? It didn't make sense to me, John, and I can go back to a year ago, kind of the same scenario when they were playing the Lions on Thanksgiving, that you were in that kind of same situation with not a lot of time left, but they pushed the ball down the field. I don't know if you remember, Allen had that, awesome pass over the middle that Diggs made an awesome catch oh, yeah. kept them going got them to within field goal range and bass delivered and they ended up winning that game I thought at the end of the first half maybe they should have tried something but for sure at the end of regulation that I mean that's what a championship team does not do what the Bills did in that situation and just play for overtime you try to get something to give your team a chance to win in regulation and not have to worry about what the outcome is in OT. So, yeah, One, I'm with you. 100%. And this takes me back to we understand that the fire under Sean McDermott from a, a, a portion of this fan base is, is burning hot, hotter and hotter as these losses mount up. And it's, it's a weird dynamic because they played so well defensively. Like you said, you understand – what they're dealing with, with being down some players. But I'm not saying Rasul Douglas is Tredavious White, but I kind of look at the cornerbacks and say, I, I, I'm not looking at them as undermanned anymore. The safeties, they are what they are. They're Micah Hyde and they're Jordan Poyer. We understand their age. They're maybe not the same players they were, but that's, that's what they got out there. The defensive line is healthy. And Terrell Bernard looks like an absolute home run at the middle linebacker spot. So then you're just really dealing with, Tyrell Dodson or, or filling someone in on the weak side. So undermanned is maybe overstated at this point, understanding that, yeah, Matt Milano, Tredavious White, Daquan Jones, those are big guys that are missing, but I think that they've overcome that. So you give Sean for credit the way the defense plays a lot, but then why are they incapable? And he's kind of calling things interesting. I think one of the Eagles players said at the end of the game, once they knew what the call that the Bills were, were running on that last play, they knew Jalen Hurst was going to score running. Sean was doing a zero blitz to, to try to shoot the gap, I guess, and, and try to stop the run. But um, interesting calls. 
I think it's fair to be critical for the way that this team seems to struggle in tight moments at the end. And I think it is fair to, to say that you could put that on the head coach. Yeah, keep in mind, the win against the Giants could have been a penalty on Taron Johnson, kept the Giants' drive going too. But alas, there was not John. So it's weird coming off a loss like this, but you and I talked during the show. We talked at the beginning of this. This Bills team, they keep playing like they're playing right now. They do have a legit shot still. I mean, they're on the outside looking in when it comes to the playoff picture. But uh, I don't see anyone in front of them right now going on some big run where, you know, there's teams that they're just not going to be able to catch if they don't put a winning streak together. So I'm looking right now, Bills 10th in the AFC right now at six and six. The three wild card teams are the Pittsburgh Steelers, seven and four. They snuffed one out again, <laughs> even though their offense is gross. Uh, the Browns, seven and four. They lost to Denver. Miles Garrett said he felt a pop in his shoulder. They uh, the injuries keep piling up for them, and they they got quarterback issues. Dorian Thompson Robinson got knocked out of the game. P.J. Walker came in. I, maybe at this point it wouldn't shock me if Joe Flacco actually did find his way onto the active roster, but but they're struggling. I mean, some some teams have to win from the AFC North, but Pittsburgh and Cleveland look like teams that definitely could fall. Indianapolis is 6-5. and five. Like, really? I don't, I mean, Houston losing. They're 6-5, and five, but they put up another fight against Jacksonville. Denver 6-5, and five, and they, they beat the Bills. So the problem here is the Bills have five losses within the conference. And you look above them, Denver, just four losses. Houston, just three. Indianapolis, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, they all just have three losses in the conference. So if the Bills are tied with any of these teams, when it either comes to head-to-head, -head, which the only team that they faced is Denver and Pittsburgh, or no, they didn't face Pittsburgh, it was last year, Denver, well, then, then it's going to go to conference record and they're going to lose. So now having six losses and six games to or five games to go, I mean honestly, I think I think they got to get to ten. So I think they got to get to four and one, and that means four wins against Kansas City, the Dallas Cowboys, the Chargers, New England, and Miami. I mean, that that that's one heck of a road. Mm -hmm. I, I think maybe the final seven seed could have nine wins, but as I just laid out, I just I think there's no way that the Bills are going to be able to overtake any of these teams in a tie-breaking scenario. All right, bye week this late in the season. I mean, is it – I asked Fred Jackson this. Is this actually a good time for it, or have they started to build something and maybe taking a week off might actually <laughs> cool things off? Yeah, it's – I mean, everybody's dinged up. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it's probably however you, you feel like shaking it. Um, I love that the buy is late. Um, and, and this is the, they're going to need to get healthy, get right, maybe make some, some tweaks, and maybe it's, I don't know, personnel or, or scheme or whatever. Um, but the margin for error is zero. I mean, they lose again, especially to an AFC team, it's over. So it, it's not moral victory against Kansas City. It's, it's a victory or we're probably right on the precipice of saying the playoffs are, are dead. So it, it's they need to get right on, on a lot of levels and they need to come out, though, with, with the same plan of attack and, and mode that they have the last two weeks, especially offensively. All right. Bills on the bye week. They return. In a couple of weeks on the road once again at the Kansas City Chiefs who are coming off a win over the Raiders, which was kind of funny, John. I looked down, the Raiders look like they're cruising over the Chiefs, and I didn't check the score until the end, and then I see the Chiefs put up 31 points. So uh, Chiefs still not an easy out. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. For John Scott, I'm Kevin Carroll. As always, thanks for joining us, everyone.